The group here? Uh-oh, what was that? I sit up like a dog when I hear that. Raise your hands. Oh, I'm sorry, you're up. Oh, you're close to heaven tonight, aren't you? Up in the heavenlies. Welcome. What church are you? Are, are you all from the same church? Cathedral of Praise in Charleston, South Carolina. Praise God. Welcome. Welcome. Amen. Let's get down here and find out where these other folks are from, from Charleston. Now, do you go to Cathedral of Praise or is Church on the Rock? How many of y'all came? Ten of you. That's a minion. That's a Jewish thing, you know. You have to have a minion. Welcome. God bless you. And where are you all from? Anywhere? Mobile, long ways, huh? Pastor's been over there ministering three days this week. Mobile will never be the same. Oh, we all from the, uh, oh, okay, you're from the Covenant Church. Was it awesome? 700, was it 750? I'm going to embarrass Pastor. 700, about 700? Huh? A ton of them. I mean, they, they were jammed in there like sardines. And when you pray for them, they can't go over, but so far, you know. But anyway, welcome. God bless you. God bless you. Where you all from? We're from uh, New Jersey. From New Jersey? Jersey, up that way, huh? Welcome. Well, God bless you. First time you've been to the revival? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't, don't talk. Pastor Tate was here a couple of weeks ago. For the pastor's conference? Was he touched? I think, yes, he was. So you had to come down and get some too, huh? Praise God. God bless you. Where are you all from? I know you're from Mobile. Fernandina, Florida. Where? Fernandina Beach, Florida. What's that close to? Amelia Island. Oh, Amelia Island. Okay, right? Is that what, what, Amelia Island? Okay, welcome. God bless you. First time to revival? Wonderful. Y'all can sit down after I get to you, but don't say, wait a minute, I haven't gotten to you. Sit down. Oh, you're with them. Oh, okay, praise God. Wonderful. Okay, let's go back here and see where some of y'all are from. We're going to be over on the, on the anointed side there in a minute, okay? Uh, Plattsburgh, New York. All the way from New York, y'all. Come all the way down just for revival? Uh, actually, I was here on business over Mobile to come down tonight for the if you don't know it, but you're here on God's business, amen? Divine appointment is Pastor Steve, uh, Brother Steve, amen? Yes, where are you from? Texarkana, Tex. Where? Texarkana, Tex. Texarkana. Let's see, that's just between Arkansas and Texas, right? Right on that line right there. That's where you have the cheapest gas prices. I usually sl slide through there. Welcome. God bless you. Welcome. Yes, where are you from? Husband and wife? Mobile, Alabama. You're a long ways away, too. God's doing wonderful things in Mobile, amen? You know that that's where the prophecy was, that this is where the, where the revival would go next, would be Mobile, Alabama. There's so many wonderful churches, amen? It's beginning to happen, amen? We don't want to leave you out up here. Go ahead, we'll try you once. Where are you from? Charleston, South Carolina. Now, you're from Charleston. Are you with that other group? Isn't that something? You've got three groups here now? Take care of my baby. Oh, and she told you? Yes. First time you've been? Welcome. Get prayed for tonight. Amen. Before you leave. Okay. Anybody from a long, long, long ways off, out of the United States or whatever? They're from, okay, I'm going to be right back. Don't lose heart. Amen. Keep the faith, brother. Where are you all from? We're missionaries in Romania. Wow. Came all the way over here for this? Are you itinerating or what? Well, welcome. God bless you. Get prayed for. Take this back to Romania. Amen. Okay, let's go back and hit a couple more, and then we're going to go across the way. We can't do everyone here tonight, but just want to kind of a, a cross-section. Where are you from? Yes, where are you from? Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City. Well, praise God. Y'all have had some tough times down there, but, but God's been in the midst, hasn't he? Amen. Done doing a lot of healing. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Let's see back. whole row of you. Do you all know each other? No? Four of you? First, us first four here from Effingham, Illinois. From Effingham, Illinois. Is that where it's flooding up there a lot? That's trying to. Okay, well, the water's poured out here every night. We call it the river. Amen. A different river here. I'm going to be around the other side here in just a moment for you. Yes, the river. The river is flowing. Amen. Praise God. Let's do one more here. Yes, where are you from? Now, you don't know them, right? You need to get to know them in case the rapture occurs, and then we can all go together. Amen. Okay, where are you all from? Minneapolis. Minneapolis, Minnesota. You come from Minnesota. That's wonderful. God bless you. Welcome. Where are you from? We're all from Minneapolis. All of y'all just escaped to the snow. You came down to the south. Amen. Welcome. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Get prayed for tonight. Let's see a whole row again. Are you all knowing each other? Or all of you together. And one up there. Where are you from? Only Illinois. Where? First Assembly, only Illinois. Only Illinois. Okay. Welcome. God bless you. All three of you. All four, five, six, whatever. Where are you from? Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Zink's place? 
Yeah, I understand 4, 000, or, or, or about 1,000 got saved two weeks ago after the pastor's conference. Isn't that wonderful? There was a pastor here, Pastor Zink. Yes, it'll happen to you, Pastor. All of you pastors need to expect the same thing because Pastor Zink, uh, uh, Pastor's a wonderful church, New Life Christian Center, isn't it? Huh? Yeah, yeah, New Life Christian Center. He was here for the pastor's conference, went back. He was left Saturday morning, went back Sunday morning. Over 1,000 people gave their heart to Jesus. Amen? So that's the kind of anointing that's here. So be encouraged. Yes, sir, where are you from? Macon, Georgia. Macon, Georgia. Any good thing come out of Macon? Come here to get more. You're going to get it, I guarantee you. Amen. All of you all from Macon? Well, God bless you. All pastors? Wait a minute. Don't. Pastor Bloomfield Church of God in Macon. There are men of the church that's hungry, too. Praise God. Isn't that wonderful? Man, it doesn't take but a handful to get on fire, man. And that fire just begins to move. Welcome. God bless you. Yes, sir, where are you from? Gainesville. Gainesville, your pastor? Uh, Patrick Saint. Oh, here's the pastor. Okay, we'll let him make the... Okay, yes, sir. Where are you from? Gainesville, Georgia. What church? Autumn Hill Assembly of God. We were, we were here for the pastor's conference, brought some of our church, and this is my music director. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm to get him to get it. Well, you get Brother Lindell up here, I'll tell you. He'll do it to him, I'll tell you that. Amen. God bless you, brother. You're going to get it before you leave tonight. Let's do a couple more, and then we're going to let Pastor take over and do some testimony. Yes, sir, where are you from? Ellerslie Baptist Church in Jordan. Baptist Church? Do you realize? Let me tell you something about the Baptist. God is touching these Baptists so awesomely. Amen. He is doing something in the Baptist. So uh, what do you expect God to do in your life? You hope he's going to. I guarantee you. Get up and get prayed for. Let Steve or Pastor lay their hands on you, and you'll never be the same kind of Baptist that you came in with. Yes, you Baptist also? Yes, I'm, I'm, their pa I'm the pastor. Your pastor from where? Uh, El Ellerson Baptist. All of you. Well, welcome. God bless you. You know, this is not a Brownsville revival. This is an all-denominational revival. God is moving so powerfully. He's breaking down the walls of partition between the denomination. Can you say Amen. So we don't care what you are. All we know is that the anointing is here. God is here. He lo Whoop, wait a minute, excuse me. There's one all alone. I like these loners that hide out in the back. See, this is called the center pew in some churches, you know, way back here in the back. But we got it anointed tonight. Where are you from? I'm from Amelia Island, Florida. Okay, that's, that's the same group that was over there. Do you know them? You can't see them. Okay, wave to her. Okay. Get, get with them later on today, and uh, you might have some good fellowship when you go back. All of you can talk about the Holy Ghost and release that anointing when you go back. We'll do one or more, one or two more, and then we'll let Pastor take over. Hi, where are you from? Gulfport, Mississippi. Gulfport, Mississippi. My goodness. Oh, I like you. Where did you get that? And then may uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Jew through Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? You're the wild olive branch grafted into my tree. You better start shaking, my. Better start shaking my nation. Amen. Where are you from? Associate Mississippi. Associate Mississippi. Okay. God bless you. Welcome. We'll do one more, two more on the way up. And we thank you so much. Let's let's do that. This is husband and wife team here. Herman Mason from McDonough Covenant Fellowship. We come down here to receive a blessing. You're gonna get it. Amen. Amen, yes. Where you, and, and you're his wife? No, you didn't. Huh? You, Mason. But, but you didn't tell me where you were from. I'm from McDonough Covenant Fellowship in McDonough, Georgia. Oh, McDonough, Georgia. Okay, praise God. Well, welcome. God bless you. Uh, oh, oh, boy, I'll tell you, when they, when they draw you out here, what's, why are you pointing to her? Why can't you? She's, oh, good. Where are you from? Uh, we're both from Honduras. Honduras? Well, welcome. You came just for revival? We were in Tennessee, and we heard about the revival, and we decided to come. What did you hear about the revival? Uh, Sister Sophia. Okay, uh, you brought them? Yes. Uh, she's the founder of a ministry in Honduras, Hands of Jesus. It supplies medical teams to the country, and she was very ill and found out her husband, I mean, her son has a terrible problem. He's seeing a psychiatrist, and... We've put his picture up in the prayer bowl. I'd been here one day about two weeks ago, and the Lord really touched me. I've never been up for prayer, but I was touched up in the balcony. And I also head up a ministry for 13 years in Mexico. I'm a missionary, so 
with my husband. So I just, I'm rejoicing. I really uh, identified with what the pastor was saying about a critical spirit, how easy it is to be in a Pentecostal move. She was in a Pentecostal move, oh, maybe 40 years, 30 years ago in her country when the Holy Spirit was first poured out and she's never seen another move of God really in that long. It's been the same old thing over and over and over, but I believe God's really gonna touch her today. She's ailing in her body and she's been to neurosurgeons, MRI, CRI, CAT scan, you name it, and nobody could do anything, but I know God can do it. Man, he's gonna do it tonight, amen? Do you believe it? Okay. I wanna say something to you real quickly before we, we turn this over. Good heaven, dead bodies everywhere. Not dead, but bodies that are being renewed. But that table is so important. Maybe some of you don't know much about it, but there have been so many miracles worked from that table there. And she just made mention that she had the picture put on the table and whatever. How come you haven't been down to be prayed for? I mean, you're hanging out in the balcony. Excuse me, folks. You've been, you, you just felt the Lord touch you up there? Or? Um, well, I have to confess, I was with an evangelist that travels all over the southeast, and he and his wife were stuck up there, and he had been holding meetings week after week. And a critical spirit got on him, and he said, um, I've been in bigger moves than this, and I'm not going to go stand in line with all those people. And I was hungry to come forward, but because they refused to come, and they kept hanging around the back, and there were so many people flooding the altar that we could really make our way through. And it's one of those things like the pastor was talking about. We have to be stripped of our pride and humble ourselves before the hand of the Lord. And like he said, you have to come maybe two or three times. And I said, God, I'm willing to humble myself. Strip me. Just because I've been in the pulpit or oversee pastors in, on the mission field, that's a bunch of baloney. I'm here for God to touch me. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. I do want to say that's classical because Pastor Steve, Steve has said so many times, don't let that person next to you stop you from coming to the altar. God bless you. Thank you, Dick. Thank you. We're going to have a few testimonies tonight of those that's been really touched by the Lord. If you're here and God has really touched you, and I want to tell you something about the Lord touching you. We've been here since Father's Day of 1995. We're a month away from being in this thing one year. This is about our 230th service somewhere in the neighborhood. Steve and I, we've been here night after night after night after night after night. We've seen 650 some odd thousand people come through these doors. So this is nothing new to us. We have seen some things that it would take us all night long to talk about. I mean, it would take days to tell you some of the stories of what God has done in this place. But folks, there is a literal river that flows through this church. And never one time since Father's Day have I walked down off this platform when the altars are open to pray for refreshing for the saints. Not one time have I walked down off this platform that I have not felt that invisible river. And I want to tell you, soon after God poured out the Holy Spirit here, I could come, you know, praying for people. I could come back in this area, right back in there, and it felt like that, that river. I may be wrong, but it sure felt like it, but it felt like that river flowed from back there in the back, and it would come around down this way sometime and turn, and sometime it would go all the way over by the river, um, by the wall and turn, just like a river, and you could feel the swiftness of the current as it would turn. And when you get in the swiftness of that current, you can't stand up. You just have to brace yourself or have somebody hold you up. Now, I don't know if it's just that way with me because I'm the pastor of the church and the, the federal headship here, but... Um, I could feel where that river would come in here and turn, and it would usually come all the way across the whole front of the building, and then usually it would take over there on the far side or either right here in this aisle, and it would turn and go back that way. And wherever that river's flowing, a lot of times when you start walking toward people, it's like a whirlpool. Will, I can feel it as you start heading toward a group of people to pray for them. It's like a whirlpool will precede you. And a lot of times before you even get there to pray for them, they're just, they go down in the spirit. The issue with us is not that you go down in the Spirit because not everybody goes down in the Spirit. And just because you don't go down doesn't mean you don't receive anything. The issue is not shaking. Just because you don't shake doesn't mean that you're not getting anything from God. But, folks, I'm telling you, there's a move of God on in this church. And there really is. There's a move of God on in this church, and God is doing some supernatural things, and it's wonderful. I wouldn't take all the money in the world for what the Lord is doing in this place because lives are changed. Over 20,000 sinners have found the Lord as their personal Savior. 20,000 sinners. 
Can you say amen? Woo! 20,000. I said 20,000! If God, if God has, if God has really touched your life, preferably we would like to hear from people that we hadn't heard from before, but if God has really touched your life, I want you to make it brief to the point. Come up here on the platform and join me quickly. Uh, come on up on the platform. I need about five, six, or seven of you, but you're going to have to make it quickly. And uh, hold your hand up if you want to give your testimony. That's right. Come on up. Hold your hand up if you want to give your testimony. Yes, ma'am. Come on up. Come on up. I need two or three more. If the Lord's really touched you and you have a powerful testimony, come on up, all right? Let's see. I heard you a while ago, honey. That's wonderful. Hang on. Just hang on. All right? Another one or two. Hold your hand up. If God's really touched you. Y'all come on up on the platform. Come on up. We need about one more. Yes, sir. Come on up, son. Come on up. What's your testimony? I have to keep, keep it brief. Well, <laughs> I've testified before, so, but I just want to tell you the, the last lesson that I have learned, the latest, not the last, <laughs> obviously. Um, I was saved August 2nd, 1995, and to survive, I'm one of those 20,000. And I've been, um, thank you. And I kept trying and trying and trying and trying. All I did was follow the instructions, and God gave us an instruction manual. It's called the Holy Bible. Every page has got an instruction on it. Just read it. And I was trying to follow it, but I was trying to do it. And three weeks ago, I almost, April 22nd, I got a phone call that my older brother had had a stroke and was in a coma. And I have witnessed here, I've witnessed in the parking lots, I, I have testified. I did not witness to my brother. The lesson I learned was on procrastination, and I didn't know if he was saved. Um, he died within 24 hours. My pastor's wife, had a, he was in Arizona, had a pastor go and pray for him. He did, and I didn't know if I could go, but the Lord provided. I went to Arizona, and the Lord told me when I was praying for my brother and my family and repenting for procrastinating, that if I would rejoice and praise in my time and sorrow, he would use me. And he did. I went to Arizona. I witnessed to my brother's children, to his grandchildren. My other bro I have four brothers. My other brother, I have three left, was there. I called the pastor at the church. The pastor invited me to the church, and I went, and he invited me to testify, and I ended up preaching my first sermon. <laughs> I testified for over an hour. That's a warning. And I told him about revival, I told him about that, and the Lord did use me because these people, it was their first Assembly of God church, they said they were Pentecostal, and I kind of had a little shock when the pastor said, please be seated for praise and worship. And I went, okay, I was the only one standing. I, I couldn't sit, and they sang all slow songs, but I danced anyway, I, I didn't care. The only Pentecostal I know about is Brownsville, and I found my own church, Faith Temple Assembly of God. So I've only seen, that's what I call Pentecostal. When I left, they were standing. When, and after I gave my testimony, they, the first one to the altar was my younger brother. Praise God. That's wonderful. Praise God. Isn't that great? <laughs> What's going on? Y'all together? Y'all together? What's going on? Uh, my friend brought me, and I've been raised United Methodist. In, um, Is this your first time? Here? Yeah. No. I've been coming, what, a couple months. But um, You're Methodist? Yes. Does all Methodists do this? No. no. And, um, and I'm going to fall out in my church, and I don't know what they're going to do with me. And, um, uh, but I've been praying for my husband, and, and please pray for him, because... Tonight he's real upset that I'm here, but I had to come. And I had a disease, and I came here just to be prayed for for healing. And I said, Lord, just just touch me, do whatever you want to do with me. And my my children are on fire, and and I'm on fire, and I witness in my in my place of business like we've done before. And 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 I don't hold still a lot anymore. Um, 
But Bonnie didn't want to testify, and, and the Lord says she's got to. She's just got to about what's happening and, and what she's done, and friends are coming, and, and we're not going to leave our church. We're going to set it on fire, and, and the preachers won't come, and, and they won't listen, and, and we're going to do it anyway. And, this is just the best thing that's ever happened in my whole life, in my whole life, and I praise you so much for, for being you, obedient to God and being here. Did you get saved here? I thought I was saved when I came here, and I didn't have any idea what the Lord was. I didn't have any idea at all, not at all. And Do you know now? Yeah, and I want more. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. What's your name? Grady Morris. Where are you from? Carlsbad, New Mexico. Wow. Was you here for the conference? No, sir, I was not. I just read a letter from Carlsbad, New Mexico. I guess somebody was here from the conference. I thought maybe, are you a pastor? No, sir. Not, you look like one. My pastor's headed this way, though. Oh, get him, get him, get him. <laughs> Lord, now, what, happened, what happened to you? What's your testimony? Last night was my first time here physically, but I have been here in these services with you by videotape many times. Folks, by the tapes. Take the tapes home, have people into your home, show the videos, be prepared to pray for them because you never know when God's going to say, pray. And I want to tell you a story that happened to us last Saturday. We were going from Carlsbad down to El Paso, Texas, about 150 miles, and halfway down is a little town of Cornutus. Population is eight people. The mayor and the owner of... That's a family. That's not a town, man. <laughs> The mayor and the owner of the local restaurant there told us, she says, the, 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 this budget problem with the government has really hurt the National Park Service. They've been closed too much, and that hurts our business. She says, if I don't have a turnaround in my business in two months, I'm going to have to shut down. And she was standing there making some popcorn for the wife, and I says, give me your hands. And she says, my hands are greasy. I says, good, we need them old. And I took her hands, and I said the simplest prayer I think I have ever prayed in my life. Lord, you heard her say she needs a change in this business. We don't put our trust in tourists. We put our trust in you. Turn it around. And we drove off. This was about 9.30 in the morning. We went on into El Paso, took care of our business. We came back about 2.30 in the afternoon. There was an army convoy parked out front. <laughs> An army convoy. An army convoy. The, uh, El Paso is a major army base. and She ran out of popcorn, didn't she? Oh, I hope to tell you. We pulled up, and I'm just thinking, Lord, look at this. Look at this. And I went in, and she was all smiles. And I says, isn't this great? She says, you don't understand. I said, what do you mean? She says, 30 minutes after you left this morning, the first wave started coming in, and it's been this way all day. Wow. And she looked at me, and she says, you know, God answers prayer. Uh, I'll say. <laughs> What's your name? Where are you from? My name is Bobby. I'm from New Orleans. Um, I'm 20 years old, and I'm uh, with Bonifay Teen Challenge. I just... I've been with Teen Challenge now for a month, and the Lord's put on my heart tonight for you teenagers out there. The Lord loves y'all. He loves y'all so much. He's done so many things for me in just one month, just because I asked him to. The Lord loves y'all. Just come to him. Just come to him. I'm from New Orleans. I, I know how it is out there. So much crime, so much sin. There's so many teenagers every day that are just dying. They're dying and they're going to hell. Y'all, he's the only answer. I promise y'all, he's the only answer. This is John Davis. He's in revival over at Ferry Pass Assembly. John, how's this revival touched your heart? It's changed my life. I, uh, I remember 
going through a stage in my life when I felt like that anybody that would fall in the spirit was somebody that just maybe wasn't as strong as it needed to be. And you're Assembly God preacher. You, you're Assembly God for many, many years. 21 years. I came down here because I know you and Paul Wetzel and good friends. And uh, Holy Ghost, I don't know how it happened, but I found myself on my fanny right over there, just laying there before the Lord. And as I lay there trying to get up, I got up and uh, somebody else passed by and I fell down again. Third time I was laying there, I heard uh, sound like a nine-year-old girl that was crying laying there beside me. And God said, that's your wife. And I'm healing her. The inferiority complexes, the feelings of inadequacy that she's had through the years that you've tried to help her with, don't touch it. He said, I'm healing her. Pastor, she's speaking this Sunday at our church in Ozark, Missouri, and she's never before stood before a congregation and spoke. I've got five people that are here from the Revival Center. We've sent 30, 30 people down so far. And my whole goal is to get as many people here as I can, knowing that when they leave, they're going to spread the fires back, not just in Ozark, but across the nation and around the world. I'm excited about revival. How does this change your ministry? It's a new touch. I find myself even uncomfortable standing here. There was a time in my life in ministry when I could come up and, and quote books, chapters, and, and say things, and I knew I, and how to move the crowd. But This man is a walking Bible. He can quote, I mean, you ought, you ought to hear him. I've known John for years. He's a walking Bible, honestly. And uh, he told me that he was relying a lot on his mind, you know, and his talent to quote the Word. And, and what he just said was he's uncomfortable standing here tonight because God's done something new in him, and those old things that he used to rely on, he don't rely on them anymore. I really don't know how to explain it. I go to the, to the pulpit. This is our third week of revival with Paul Wetzel. Very past. We're going Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, this week, I go to the platform, and uh, even though I've prepared my heart, and I have a message, many have been the nights that you go up, and it's just not there. The Holy Spirit takes over. The last night we was there, I walked to the platform, and it was like I was in a whirlpool. The glory of God was just swirling all around the place. The Holy Ghost began to give an altar call one night, no preaching, people's lives set free, and uh, I tell you, folks, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It's like I've been born again, again. And there's something in me that says, Lord, let me share this with you. Ten years ago on a 21-day sabbatical, seeking God, sick of myself but hungry for reality, God said there's going to be one last wave come across America and then the rapture. And when I came down here, I heard the Lord say, this is it. I'm... Coleman Lackey, he's been an evangelist for 150 years. He sits out there tonight. He told me last night that he received something here that he had never received in his life. And he said, when he goes back, it's going to be different. My goal, I don't mind saying this, our mission's budget back in Ozark, and I'm an evangelist. I travel out all the time. I've asked God for two things. Number one, give us extended meetings and give me a passion for souls like he's given Steve. I've seen nothing like it, folks. I've sat here, and one night, oh, my God, my one night, it was like an invisible hand just began to move, and I saw hundreds of sinners run down the aisle, and I turned to Deb. I heard the weeping and the moaning and the crying. I've read about this in Jonathan Edwards' meetings and the meetings of bygone days. I said, Deb, this is it. As sinners just begin to run down the aisle, now listen to me, folks. I'm not worshiping a place, but the 30 people that we've sent from the Revival Center, some of them are here tonight. I've got five here tonight. They go back. The glory comes with them. We're praying. Holy Ghost is moving there. Awesome things are happening. And my mission's budget at the Revival Center, and I'm for foreign missions a thousand percent, but God told me a long time ago if we'll get our evangelists and our pastors on fire for God in America and see the fires begin to burn in America like never before, then we'll spread the gospel overseas. And that's my goal. What I want to happen tonight, Stephen, we pray around the altars. I want you to lay your coat. I know it sounds strange, but I want you to take your coat off and lay it on John. He's praying that God will give him a mantle, a new mantle for souls like you have. Would you do that? Okay. Everybody stand together, please. Brother Lendl.
can while you're standing. We're just going to very quickly take up the offering tonight, give you a chance to sow seed into this wonderful fellow soil. Amen. After you hear these testimonies that you've heard tonight, even a man who's been preaching the gospel for 20-some years, how his life has been changed. I know my life has been changed. You can't help but every night when we pray, dear Jesus, speak to my heart and change my life. This is fertile soil. Will the ushers come quickly? If you're from another church, please do not put your offering into this church. If you're a pastor of a church, you may consider supporting this revival, but that's entirely up to you. But please, don't put your tithe into this congregation or into this offering tonight if you're not part of what Brownsville is all about because this is a revival. We will receive offerings, but your tithes go to your home church. Let's bow our head very quickly. Father, I thank you for the wonderful move. And even, Lord God, the skeptics that are here, Lord God, they're beginning to see there's something to this soil, to this fertile soil that you've produced here. Lord God, bless the people as they give tonight, Lord God, sowing seed into that hot, fertile soil of revival here at Brownsville. Bless them, Lord God. Return to them a hundredfold to that which they have sown. And, Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you begin to give tonight. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. You can be seated. I'm sorry. Please be seated. God bless you. Hopefully that won't last long. Somebody came up to me a while ago and said, how do y'all rehearse and keep everything going? And I said, well, we just did. We just did a song we didn't know. When you're in revival for 10 months, 11 months a year, you just kind of do it as you go, you know? Glory to God. How many wants more of the Lord?
it causes me to know how much I need you. Send your glory, send your glory, send your power, send your power, send your power, Lord, send your glory, send your glory, come and change me, come and change me, send your glory. going to come and give the sermon, but I just had to share this right quick. Everybody who comes to this meeting, the number one thing that happens is every one of us on this stage, it has happened to us, it will happen to you, not just because of this revival, but the Lord says, unless you humble yourself as a little child, and you say, Lord, I don't have everything, and a lot of people said, why do I have to come to Pensacola? Well, you don't, but maybe you do just depends on your heart. It depends on how much humbling the Lord needs to do in you. I had to go all the way to Canada with money I didn't have. It's the attitude of your heart that the Lord is looking at. And I want to tell you, this boy right here has been in church. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was five years old under a tent in a revival. I've seen it all. But I want to tell you something. I feel just like tonight, I'm beginning fresh and new. And I just want to say, we want to sing it one more time. I just want to say, Pastor Steve, Lord, there's more to you that I don't know anything about. Lord, we've only seen through a glass darkly. There's more. There is much, much more to you. And I want more of you, Lord. 
Whatever you have to do to work in me, just do it, God. Just do it. I'm hungry. I humble myself, Lord. Lord, I groan. Lord, I kneel. My heart is crying out for something real. Because I know deep in my soul there's more to God than we know. Yes. I'm tired. Yes, I'm weak. I need your power to come and work in me. I won't let go, Lord. I'm going to keep holding on because there must be more. Oh, yes, there must be more. Yes. Oh, there must be more. Oh, yes. River flow, come on. pray together the prayer we've been praying since since Father's Day and tonight when we start praying for everybody if you want prayer please don't hesitate okay because we're gonna start praying there's about 400 teenagers that are in a back room tonight they're normally in here they're gonna come flooding in this place okay and they're gonna push their way right in front of you all right they want prayer Pastors, there's nothing like it. We watch teenagers going after God all into the night, early into the morning. They're going after God. They want to be prayed for. They want to be more anointed. They want God to use them. So when, you, when we open it up for prayer tonight, and you're sitting there, you're wondering, well, well I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to see how things work out. Friend, we're going to be praying for thousands of people tonight. Please, just step out from the aisle. Come up and take care of it, okay? Get prayer tonight. But I want to share this with you before you sit down and before we pray. How many are desperate for the touch of the Lord tonight? I can usually tell when a man is hungry for God. I have said before that I was hungry for the Lord, but I really wasn't. Okay, a man, a starving man is going to eat. He's going to go after God. And, and I wrote this a while back, and I wrote it for preachers, but it's for everybody. It's just a paragraph. A man's desperation for the presence of God will melt all his preoccupation with self, notoriety, public image, 
and social status. Your hunger and your thirst, if it's genuine, will drive you to eat and to drink regardless of the opinion of others. You will be willing to be a fool in the sight of your peers in order to be embraced in the arms of the Lord. Now, I wrote more than that, but that's enough for tonight. Are you willing to be a fool in the sight of your peers? John Davis, I don't know if you know this, but a few minutes ago, because you've become so yielded to the Holy Ghost, brother, the power of God hit you at this pulpit. As soon as he hit you, he hit Charlie. That's never happened to you before, has it, brother? When I want to tell you what can happen, now Charles was standing a long way off. This may sound strange to you, but in the history of American revivals, it's not strange. In the history of world revivals, it's not strange for a person to receive a touch from God here or right there and say something like, Now, Lord, and people a quarter of a mile from there are hit by the power of God. And it's because people are willing to receive from the Lord. But if you're here tonight, like so many uh, beggars, and I, I use that term lightly and uh, carefully in the United States of America, we have very few honest to goodness beggars. Most of them are choosers. Most of them, you know, are, they're, they're out there and they just, you know, uh, they want you to give them some money so they can go down and eat at, you know, at Quincy's Salad Bar. And, and if you tell them to go eat the Salvation Army, they'll tell you they don't want that. And the, this country's full of people like that, but in Christianity, we're the same way. We have our, we have our, uh, our minds made up of what we're going to receive from the Lord and how we're going to receive it. Don't go after God like that, friend. Go after a crumb that falls from his table. Say, Jesus, if you'll just drop my tongue, drop a drop of your water on my tongue tonight, that's more than I've ever received, Lord. Just touch this barren soul. Touch this dry, thirsty soul tonight, and I'll praise you for it. If you go after God like that, friend, stuff is going to happen. Stuff is going to pastors. Those of you that are dealing with major problems at your church, see, Pastor John Kilpatrick is pastoring this revival, but he's pastoring it with power. And there's a big difference. When the power of God is coming down, problems melt. Marriages that you would spend months counseling are just healed automatically in the revival. The power, and it's a whole different story. You need the power tonight to be willing to go after it. Right now, let's pray before you're seated. We're going to pray the same prayer we've been praying for, since Father's Day. This is for every single person. Pray with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart, speak to my heart. Change my life. Change my life. In, your precious name. In your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I believe everyone is here under divine appointment. I said I believe everyone is here under divine appointment. If you've ever done anything right in your life, it's come tonight. You're supposed to be here. First time visitors, you're supposed to be here. 650,000 people that have come through here. We're supposed to be here on that particular night. Every night is different and you need to settle that in your heart. You are in the right place at the right time. How many would say thank the Lord? That's where we're at tonight. I want to be here, Jesus. I believe the message is for you tonight. Last night, I preached on the night cometh, and it was one of the hardest messages I've ever preached. On, I've never preached like that on a Wednesday night, but the Lord spoke to my heart yesterday early in the morning that there are some people, they're at the very end, they think life is going to continue on, and I spoke last night on night cometh when, and when, when no man can work. While it is day, repent. While it is day, repent. Get your life right with God. I spoke on that last night. While it is day, get your relationships with others in order. While it is day, get those things right that are wrong in your life. While you have time, friend, and while it is day, do the work that God has called you to do. Some of you, God has spoken to me, to you. God, I'll never forget a man that came up to me and he stuffed $500 in my face and he said, use this in your mission work. And I backed off.
because I felt it was given to me in the wrong spirit. And I said, talk to me about your life. And he said, when I was 18 years old, I was called to be a missionary and I fought God. And I said, later I'll do it, God. But right now, I want to be a success in the work and then I'll give to you, God. But right now, I'm not going to be a missionary. And so he went on and studied and he became one of the most successful real estate brokers in the area. Now he's a multimillionaire and he came up to me and he shoved that in my face. He's 58 years old now. And he said, take this, Brother Steve, and use it. I said, brother, I wouldn't touch that money. Let me tell you something right now. You're a young man. 58 is young. You go after God right now with all your heart, soul, and strength. You fulfill the call that God has placed on your heart. If you don't, you will stand before him on judgment day. We're not the, it's, a, it's a lie if you think one day you'll stand before the Lord, friend, and everything's just going to be sort of washed clean. No, he's taking notes. There will be a judgment one day, friend, for how you lived down here on this earth. So I spoke last night on the night cometh. When you're not going to be able to fulfill that call in your life, do it now. And I shared the illustration about Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard, I was with him just a couple days before he died. As a matter of fact, the day he died, Martha called me 30 minutes afterwards, his widow, and said, Leonard's gone on to be with the Lord. And I was with Leonard just a few days before he died. And Len, I said, Len, if you had to do it all over again, what would you change at 87 years of age? What would you change about your life? Those of you that don't know who Leonard Ravenhill was, he's, he wrote some of the greatest books on revival. He was a, a friend of Smith Wigglesworth and just a power A.W. Tozer and just a, a great man of God. Wrote seven great, wonderful books on revival. Get them all and read them all. I said, what would you do if you had to do it all over again? What would you change? And he looked up at me and he said, absolutely nothing. He said, I've sought God all my life. And he said, last night I spent six hours with the Lord. I wouldn't change a thing. I have done the very best I can to follow the Lord. While it is day, friend, do that. While you still have time, do everything you can. Young people, while it is day, man, go after God. None of this garbage of when I get older, I'll follow God. No, you follow God now. I could change the world like John Wesley said, give me 100 men that hate sin and love God and I'll change the world. Now, young people, hate sin, love God, and shake your school for Christ. You can do it right now. How many believe that? I believe it. Tonight I'm going to preach a message. Charity, I want you to come and sit next to Dick Rubin. She's going to sing Run to the Mercy Seat. How many of you are going to sleep through this sermon? Good. Very good. If you do, I'll come after you, friend. If somebody starts storing next to you, I just want you to wave at me. Just do this. All right? We got this little microphone. I'll come hunt you down. And if you're snoring, I'll stick it right in your nose. You'll be on nationwide television, friend. You better think about it before you go off. If you ever need it, I say that. It's humorous, but I say it in seriousness. You need to listen to the Word of God tonight, regardless of how tired you are. You say, well, I've worked all day, brother, and I've come to this revival. I'm tired. All of us work all day. All of us. I've been putting 18-hour days in, friends, since this revival started. We don't sit around and rest all day long. We have to work also. Pastor, pastors. Sometimes he'll be out visiting all day long, visiting his flock, and come flying in here at 7 o'clock. Just left the hospital, been to the hospital for three or four hours. Had a funeral that day, all kinds of stuff. Everybody's working. Charlie, he's here every single night, but he works all day long as a mechanic over at Key Ford. He's there every day, working, making a living, and gets off work, grabs a bite, off to the revival since Father's Day. Revival is going to break out into your church, it's going to cost you. Just get ready for that. It will cost you. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. It's awfully early for me to begin my message, but I'm going to do it anyhow. Some of you are looking at your watches and going, Dear God, man, I've never been in church two hours. 
Friends, we've had services here eight hours. When this first broke out during the summertime, we were watching the sun come up. And I, back then, my wife and I were at the residence inn, and I'd be, I'd be driving back to the residence inn, I'd go, this is strange. Because <laughs> I went to church when it was going down, <laughs> and I'm coming back when it's coming up. The power of God is just moving, friend. You couldn't get away. It's wonderful. I'll never forget the early days of this revival. And, and by the way, summertime is going to be the same. We're not scaring you off by saying that, that uh, the service is going to go on until 4 and 5 in the morning. But during the summertime, when people want to stay, they stay, especially young people. But when this revival first broke out, uh, we could not go anywhere for the first, like, three weeks. We'd go over to the mall. And I remember walking down the mall, court of a mall, and these three ladies started walking towards me, and they screamed just bloody murder and started running for their lives. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. And they just stopped like that because they are afraid they were going to get zapped. <laughs> and I had no idea because, you know, 100,000 people had come through the revival by then, something like that. And so a lot of folks had been. They knew what was going on over there, and they thought, you know, that, that uh, we are just got some type of power that we just walk around zapping people. And I walked into a, a store to buy a suit, and this, then this one lady behind the counter, she goes, don't touch me! This is like that, and I went, hey, I'm here to buy a suit. <laughs> I'm not here to touch you. <laughs> but, uh, oh, it's something else. That's still going on, friends. There's not a place you can go for hours from here. We'll be, we'll, we'll be just pumping gas an hour and a half from the revival. Walk in and, and, and be paying for the gas, and the guy will go, how's that revival going? Still going good? I've been talking out in the sticks, friend, out in the sticks. And I'll go, you go to the revival? Oh, I've been. My whole family's been. My pastor's been. None and none. My brother was saved. My sister was saved. Friends, God's moving. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's one of the beauties of the longevity of it. Gets people, gives people time to get saved. Luke chapter 7, verse 11. And it came about soon afterwards that he went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large multitude. Now as he approached the gate of the city, behold, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin. And the bearers came to a halt, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. And fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report concerning him went out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. I've entitled this message tonight, rather than entitling it John's, or Luke chapter 7, 11 through 16, I've given it a real title. It's called Another Foiled Funeral. And I get that from D.L. Moody made this comment. He said, Jesus spoiled every funeral that he went to. Jesus spoiled every funeral that he went to. To foil means to prevent from obtaining an end, to frustrate. Friend, I can guarantee you the morticians and the undertakers were not accustomed to inviting Jesus to their uh, communities. They had heard about that man. They were, he was bad for business. Can't you see him? Morticia going, dear God, here comes Jesus. <laughs> Martha, just when the money was rolling in, <laughs> here he comes. That's how people handle the, some of the miracles of Jesus anyway. It's amazing, you know, how a withered hand would just grow out in front of them like that, you know, and just uh, miracles. And, and folks, some would go, it's God, it's God. Others would go, you can't do that on Sunday. <laughs> you can't do that. Hmm. 
Well, glory. I know we're supposed to preach this tonight. Another foil funeral. Before going any further, I'd like to let everyone know that the devil has a spiritual funeral planned for each and every one of us. He came to steal, to kill, and destroy. He's got your burial plot picked out and your casket measurements on file. He wants to be there the day you're wheeled down that dusty road to hell. He wants to hear the first piercing screams as you pass from this earthly life to your, your eternal destiny. Yes, he's got your funeral planned. The pallbearers from hell are ready to tote your corpse. But I'm here to tell you, things change when Jesus comes on the scene. Things change when Jesus comes on the scene. Perhaps it's hard for you to imagine this type of funeral procession, but let me give you a little background of what probably was going on here before we get to the meat of this message. I remember being in a city called La Caviche, Belarus. We're church planters. We plant churches around the world. And uh, we were planning a church in the city, a small town in, in Belarus, which is part of the former Soviet Union. And um, we were there, and we're at the bus station waiting on a bus. And in a lot of these countries, you do a lot of waiting, okay? Just wait all the time. And, and ¿Dónde son de, son de Honduras? ¿Dónde están ustedes? Bueno, bienvenidos. Y trabajaba yo en Costa Rica y también en Argentina por siete años. Estuvimos trabajando también en España. And in every one of those countries that you go to, there's a lot of waiting going on. And anyway, we're waiting for this bus. By the way, that, God worked on my heart in those countries because I was one of those, I had to have everything now. I was a perfectionist. I want to tell you, friend, when you have to wait hours for a bus, when it takes you eight hours to pay a phone bill, God deals with your heart about some of that. <laughs> anyway, God worked on this old boy. We were sitting at that bus station, just passing the time of the day, swatting flies, and, and I heard a band, like a Salvation Army band going on. And so I got up and went out, and, and coming down the street was this procession of mourners. And there was this pickup truck covered with flowers, and in the back of the truck was a corpse. Okay, not in a casket. He was a, just a corpse with his head sticking out. It was covered with flies, and he, it was flowers all around, and everybody was mourning up and down and, and, and wailing over this man. And I watched his funeral go by. You may say, well, that sounds primitive. Friend, that's basically how the rest of the world does it. All right, they don't have all these thousands of dollars we have. They wouldn't waste money on embalming fluid. You know, they're just going stick to them, stick them in the back of the truck. You know, they, they'll keep them above the earth until he stinks too bad, and then they'll put them under. But this was a typical funeral in Belarus. And so I, I, I had seen that, and now when I read this story, it, it helps me a little bit more to understand what they might have seen in this country. In those days, it was customary, and Dick, you may need to correct me on this, but I believe I'm correct. In those days, it was customary to have many mourners at any given funeral. As a matter of fact, you could have hired mourners. That means professional mourners, people that would come in, Tony, when you, when you croaked, and, and, they would, and, and there wasn't enough people to cry for you. <laughs> How many's bought one of Tony's t-shirts? Yeah. Amen. You'd have a lot of people cry for you, man, because all them t-shirts. I mean, we love your t-shirts, brother. But if something happened to your brother and you died, and back in those days and enough people weren't around to cry for you, they'd hire some folks. They'd say, man, dress up in black, go over there and act like it means something to you. <laughs> so they'd sit around and they'd mourn. Am I telling the truth, Dick? They would have professional mourning. They may still do that to this day. Maybe not. Do they? They still have them to this day, even in this country. <laughs> the body, <laughs> why did you have to say that? Now everybody's, <laughs> 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 the
The body was prepared for burial within 24 hours of death, and the mourners stayed with the corpse until it was placed in the tomb. And so that's pretty much the situation that was going on. By the way, Luke is the only one that records this story, and I find it interesting since he was a doctor. Another thing I'd like to point out before going any further is that this took place the day after the centurion's servant was healed. When it comes to Jesus, great healings and victories are followed by great healings and victories. You need to hear that. Some of you are wondering, well, if God pours out his spirit on me and starts blessing me, what about tomorrow? What about tomorrow? Maybe tomorrow will be greater than today. When it comes to Jesus, great healings, great victories follow great healings and great victories. I'm expecting any day, friend, for the dead to be raised around this place. You may be satisfied with this revival. We're not. I love what's happening in this revival, friend, but I'm not going to be satisfied till ambulances pull up out front. They just, but when a car wreck takes place out on I-10, they drive them by here first. Yeah. Hallelujah. There's never an end to the power of God. Let me establish a couple more points before continuing the making of this miracle. I want to establish this for you critics out there, you skeptics. The boy was dead. All right? Could you say that with me? The boy was dead. Let's call him Bob. Bob was dead. Say that with me. Bob was dead. Because you'll read, folks. There's, there's people, they'll read that and go, yeah, but he was sleeping. You know? <laughs> he was the only son of a widow. That means, my friend, her husband was dead also. This may sound elementary to you, friend, but I'm trying to paint a picture. The boy was dead, and she was a widow. That means her husband was dead also. This was at least her second time around. The thing that she had feared the most had come upon her. She was losing her last possession in life. Her husband was dead and gone, and now her son was being carried down the same road. Her past was haunted by the death of her husband. Her present was plagued by the death of her only son. Now her future is poisoned by the thought of no one to care for her on this earth. I want you to see the predicament of this woman. This is important for those of you that are going through struggles. In several places, I want you to understand also, in Scripture, grief, for an only son is described as the deepest distress a soul can feel. I prepared this message this morning, friend, and had the greatest time of my life researching grief and mourning. I enjoyed this. Jeremiah 6, 26. O daughter of my people, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make the mourning as for an only son. That means Weep over your sins. Break over your sins as if your only son had died. Three times I found today in the scriptures where it compares that, that type of mourning. The deepest, darkest distress you can go through is when your only son dies. I am a man with one son, two daughters and one son. I cannot imagine losing my boy. Today, I don't know what you do, fathers, with your son, but I like hugs. And today, I was just sitting on the couch, and I said, come on over here, boy. He came over, Ryan came over, and he just laid on my lap. And I put my arm around him. I said, I love you. He goes, I love you. I love you. No, Daddy, I love you. I just love you. I just love you too, Dad. How many know what I'm talking about? He's my boy. And I love him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Once again, she was a widow. Here was her only boy, cut down in the prime of life, just ripening into manhood, the one who would have carried on the family name. How she would give anything now to trade places with him. Let him live and grow and enjoy life. Take me, God. 
but the boy was dead. The corpse was prepared for burial. The visitors had come and gone from her house. Some had brought food. One brought a loaf of bread. Others perhaps brought a few fish, but she couldn't eat because grief had overtaken her and stolen away her desire for food. The time of the funeral had come. She slipped on a mourning garment. Stay with me, friends, because some of you are right here. You have come into this church tonight. You may be wondering how on earth does this sermon relate to me. I haven't had anybody die. I want to tell you, there's people in this room. You are the one in that casket. You are the one dying. You are the one that Jesus is going to touch tonight. Others of you are in the deepest distress of your life. You are in the, the worst position you've ever been in. All hell is breaking loose in your life. Everything's coming apart at the seams. You're like this woman walking along. Her husband was dead. Her son had died. She has no future. God brought you here tonight, friend. He's going to shape your life after this evening. Does that make sense to anybody? The time of the funeral had come. She slipped on her mourning garment that, that someone had prepared for her just a few years earlier for her husband's funeral. She had considered giving it away, knowing she would probably not have to need it again. But now she was slipping on that same garment, the garment of mourning, perhaps a black mourning cloth, again, to turn over a loved one to the angel of death. She's ready. And the procession begins. Now this is what I heard in Belarus, and I want you to hear it tonight. The funeral had begun. My first point to you tonight, friend, for those of you, your life is falling apart, it's coming apart at the seams, is this. Jesus works his greatest miracles when all hope is gone. Jesus works his greatest miracles when all hope is gone. It is over. You are at the point of exhaustion. You're like the woman with the issue of blood. You've spent all your money. You've seen all the doctors. You're at the end of your rope. It's over. You're going to die. That is when Jesus can work a miracle in your life. It's when you're like blind Bartimaeus on the side of the road. He was blind, friend. He was begging. He was poor. He was screaming out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He was at the point of desperation. I'm asking you, friend, where are you at tonight? Are you at the point of destitution? Here the widow is at the very end. In a few moments, they would seal her son's tomb with a stone. No more sending her son down to the city well to draw water for her daily needs. I don't know if you've ever had anybody die in your family, but I have. I've buried family members. I've hurt deep inside. Memories just enter your mind. You can't brush them off. You fill your, your mind, your thoughts, all the past moments that you had with that individual. This is a woman. She's walking down that road, and all around her, people are going, oh, oh, oh. They're wailing and weeping, and her mind is going back. No more, no more cooking his favorite meal. No more is he going to come into the house and say, Mama, you didn't have to do that for me. Biscuits and gravy, Mama, that's my favorite. No more. No more intimate conversations about his possible future marriage. No more intimate conversations, friend, with his or son about grandchildren. Maybe, just maybe, 
In the funeral procession, there could have been a girl named Rebecca or Maria that had been coming over to the house and her mama turned to the son one day and said, honey, you know, Rebecca's a good looking gal. She might be the one for you, son. And mama and the son had an intimate conversation about marriage. No more talk about that. Her son was dead and gone. The days were gone of sewing new garments for his skinny little frame, which was now bulging with muscles of manhood. No more taking care of the boy. No more hugs at bedtime. Like only a mother can give. No more times of sitting next to his bed and saying, honey, before you go to sleep tonight, I just want to tell you I love you. Mama, I love you too. It's over. No more dreaming about the future of a son who was going to take care of her when she was too old and too weak to care for herself. Her mind could have gone back, friends, to when she nursed him as a little baby. She's still in the funeral procession, walking down that dusty road that she had walked just a few years earlier. Some of you tonight have been hit so hard. It's like one tragedy after another. You can relate to what I'm talking about tonight. It's like you're going to the end. It's all over for not only this part, all of it, your whole life is washed up. Maybe she remembered back when she nursed a tiny boy. She loved on him through childhood and adolescence. She remembers bedtime stories and nursery rhymes. And as she scuffles along, deep in her mourning, and she hears the anguish of the other mourners, suddenly it's interrupted. She hears a voice. It sounds just like her boy, like being stunned awake out of a bad dream. She looks up, and she sees a young man across the way calling out to another friend. And she goes, oh, it sounded just like him. And suddenly, reality enters again. For a split second, she left her nightmare. For a split second, it was over. Hope came in and vanished it quick, as quickly as it came. And now, that dread comes over her again. My baby is gone. But remember, friend, Jesus performs his greatest miracles when all other hopes are gone. Would you say amen? amen. When all other hopes are gone, Jesus performs his greatest miracles. Pastor, you can relate to this, friend. Listen to me. Just as a crowd of grievers leaves the city gates, they are confronted by another crowd. Here we have the meeting of two processions. One is the funeral, the procession of death, the widow, the dead son, and the great crowd of mourners. Tonight, friend, listen to me. To me, this is a picture perfect of mankind today. This is a striking picture of the state of man. He is dead in trespasses and sins. He is surrounded by the angels of death. Gloom, misery, hopelessness is all around him. And he's walking into this procession. He's heading straight to hell. It's all over. And suddenly, he runs in to another procession. Some of you tonight came walking right in these doors. You have been hit. We're facing you, friend. You've been hit by life. That's the second group. It's called the procession of life. Jesus and a great company of followers who were constantly living on the edge of their seats. 
still emotionally high strung from the previous day's miracles. Face to face stands the Prince of Peace, the Lord and giver of life, the resurrection and the life. He's standing there with his faithful attendants in front, the Prince of Darkness, gloom and misery and his attendance of death. Tonight, you're part of one of those two crowds, friend. Another point I want to make tonight, and this should bring hope for everyone within the sound of my voice, and if you're listening from home, friend, I want to tell you, Jesus sees you in the midst of the crowd. He saw her. I want to tell you something about mourners. I've been in some funerals, friend. When we lived in Spain, when there was a funeral, everybody looked like the widow. They were all dressed in black. Everybody was weeping and wailing. Everybody was in distress. Jesus knows who's really in distress. He knows if you're really hurting, friend. He knows what's going on in your life. Does this make sense to anybody? When their eyes met, something happened. There she was, face to face with the one who could change everything. I'm positive, friend, the last thing on her mind was that that man right there, that stranger, could give her son back to him. I know it wasn't on her mind. The Bible proves that. The Bible does not record even a small fraction of a request. She didn't scream out to him. She didn't run to him and fall down before him. All she did was grieve. Look at me, and that's enough. That's enough. Jesus knows what true sorrow is. Those of you that are going to get saved tonight, he knows what true sorrow is. He knows if you're really hurting. He knows if you really want God tonight. Jesus sees true sorrow. Jesus walks up to her, looks her in the eyes, and says, Weep not. He came up, and he touched the coffin. Friend, ain't nothing like it in the world when the hand of God touches your funeral procession. When the hand of God reaches out and takes authority over the angel of death, hell, and the grave. When the angels of the, the followers of Lucifer, when the demons of hell are Stunned by this man called Jesus of Nazareth. I'll never forget it when it happened in my life. 20 years ago, if there's ever a scripture that I could understand, friend, I was involved in a long funeral procession. I was a walking dead man. I was heading towards the tomb. But on October 28, 1975, at 11 o'clock in the morning, it was a Tuesday, a man walked into my room and he said, stop. And he touched this corpse. And it came up in newness of life, friend. You know, when Jesus said, weep not, everybody says, weep not. Don't cry. You notice that? Don't cry. Things are going to get better. Everybody says that. When Jesus says something like that, he can do something about it. <laughs> I love that, man. Those of you that are in the mully grubs here, Jesus is going to fix it. I'm telling you, weep not. He's going to fix it tonight. He's going he's to, those of you that are dry and thirsty, I mean, you're like desert dust. You're going to be so waterlogged tonight, so soaked, they're going to have to carry you out of here. 
And I'm telling you the truth. We've toted thousands of people out of this place. We use wheelchairs. My, my son said, Daddy, I thought they're supposed to jump out of wheelchairs, not jump in them. <laughs> we towed them out of here every night. And I've had pastors come up to me and go, that's my wife. That's my wife down there, man. I've never seen that in my life. Or, or wife, that's my husband. That's my husband under the power of God. He's been there for three and a half hours under the power of God. We've never, we're Methodist. We've never seen anything like this in our life. When Jesus comes on the scene, friend, boy, you know, this will preach. Jesus saw and he had compassion. Compassion means to suffer together. That was, that's what the word means. To suffer together. Jesus is here tonight, friend, to take care of business for you. He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're suffering through. This is not a hard message tonight. This is a kind message. I'm trying to help you. I really am. I'm trying to help you. If you were here last night, you'd have thought, dear God, man, you know, I've walked around this church with an ax before. I have. Walked around with a big old broad ax made in the 1800s. That looked, it's as bigger than any man's head in this place. And I preached on, God will cut you down if you don't bear fruit. And I want to tell you, friend, when I walked around with that ax, there were people that jumped up out of their seats and ran as fast as they could to the altar because they realized their life was a waste. They were not bearing fruit. And people are still getting saved today by watching that video and listening to it. That was a hard message, but it's a truthful message. God will cut you down. The keeper of the vineyards he said, give me one more year, man. He said, give me one more year. I'll tenderize this thing. You know, I'll, I'll fertilize it. I'll water it. I'll take care of this tree. And they said, yeah, okay, we'll give you one more year. Some of you are at the very last of your year. And God's going to cut you down. That's a hard message. This is a nice message. This is wonderful. This is more along the Twinkies. That was Brussels sprouts. <laughs> but this is, you can swallow this, friend. But I'm telling you, God loves you. He sees where you're at. He sees what you're going through. The last point tonight that you must do, you've got to stand still and let him touch you. The procession stopped. Would you say that with me? The procession stopped. Say it again. The procession stopped. The Lord is trying to do something in your life, friend. I love the time when blind Bartimaeus was crying out to Jesus. And he kept crying out and crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Jesus, and people were saying, would you shut up? He shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. And the Bible says Jesus stopped. And he turned around and he said, what do you want me to do for you? Heaven stood still because blind Bartimaeus was not going to move on. Did you hear me? He was not going to move on. He was going to stake his claim in the house of God. He said, I am getting my miracle. The procession stops here. This is it. No more funeral procession for me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Heal my eyes. It's got to stop, friend. You gotta stop and let the Lord touch your life. The rest of it's easy for the Lord. Young man, get up. And he rose up, said he started talking. I wonder what he said. I guarantee you there's been books written on it, you know. I've got a library full of old books. You wouldn't believe what some folks say about stuff. They, they, they just pull it out of the air, man. This is what the young man said. I don't know what he said, but I don't know what it was been like, you know. To, Get up and there's flowers all around you, you know? Maybe you smell. 
Been dead for a while. <laughs> Mama mia. Take me to the bathroom, man. I need a shower. And everybody's staring at you. The undertaker's cussing. <laughs> He's going, man, I got a down payment on that tomb. Just about had the widow's money. As <laughs> soon as I rolled that stone in front, I was, that was sealed it, man. Contract was signed, sealed and delivered. I'd have the final payment. I don't know what was going on, friend, but I guarantee you, it was a hallelujah showdown. All the things that I was sharing with you, remember? All the gloomy, terrible, horrible things that she was going through her mind, it was all gone, man. Suddenly, she can cook his favorite meal again. Suddenly, she can sit down by his bedside and say, Honey, I love you. I love you too. The Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. The Lord will restore them. He will heal you. He can do it, friend. He can do it. I'm testimony tonight, and 20,000 more are, friend, that the Lord can deliver you. He can set you free. He can change the situation. But you got to be desperate. You got to be desperate. If this message wasn't deep enough for some of you, I want to apologize. You ought to try preparing messages every day. All right? Some folks say, well, you need at least, you know, four days to prepare a message. Well, good. That's wonderful, Pastor. I love that theology. Try to preach in a revival every night, you know? Charles Finney wrote about that. He said, I just get up there and preach. I just get up there and preach, man. You know, because he did preach seven times a day. Lord, have mercy. But you're going to find out also, pastors, the simpler the message, the more profound the results. In, a, in an evangelistic meeting, you're going to find out teaching is a whole different ballgame. But in evangelistic preaching, a seven-year-old child better understand it. And if you're a seven-year-old boy in this room, you listen to me right now. Jesus will come to you at your most desperate point when all hope is gone, young man, young lady, that's when Jesus will arrive on the scene. Remember that. No matter what you're going through. As a matter of fact, there's a child here right now. You've done some stuff at home. You've stolen something. You have stolen something and you feel so guilty about it. And you want to get things right with mom. You want to get things right with God, uh, dad. But the first thing you need to do tonight is to get things right with God. You're desperate. You're desperate, young man. Young lady, you need to get things right with God first. He wants to, you, you feel hopeless. You're not enjoying anything because you've done some things that are wrong. God can meet you right there. He can forgive your sin. Parents, I want to tell you something. Stealing to a seven and eight year old is as bad to those kids as robbing a bank is to a 25 year old. I've had kids wail at these altars. Wail. And you would think that they had been molested as children or something. No, and they'll come up and they'll share about some crime they committed at home, some money they stole out of mama's pocketbook, and they have been harboring that for months. And they're just wailing because Jesus spoke to their hearts about it. Hallelujah. I mean, it's all about holiness, isn't it, friends? Getting right. But Jesus will come to you tonight. This is what we're going to do. I want charity to come right now. We're going to have some foiled funerals. There's some backslidden people in this room. Look at me, everybody, in the, chat, in, in, in the balcony down here. There's some backslidden folks in this. I want to tell you where I see you. You're on the back of a cart going down the dusty road, friend. There's flies all over you, and you know it. You're heading towards the tomb. You're dying. The drum is beating in the background. You see yourself just slipping away. I want to tell you, tonight, tonight, you have been confronted with another procession, and they've stopped right in front of you. You have a choice. You have a choice. You can shoo God away. You can say, get out of my face, God. I don't want anything to do with you. 
I don't want anything to do with your new life and go on to hell, friend. You can go on. Satan's got a plan. He's already got your measurements. He know, he's got your tomb picked out. He knows where you're heading. He'll hear your screams. He's got a plan for you, friend. Or you can stop and say, Dear God, I want to live again. I want to live again. It's up to you tonight, friend. Backslider, you come home to Jesus right now. Charity's going to sing a song called Run to the Mercy Seat. Everyone in this room that needs Jesus Christ to forgive them, do not hesitate right now at this altar call. Look at me, everybody. Don't let anything distract you. It makes no difference if you're a child or you're in your late 70s or 80s. You need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away. You need to come down to these altars as soon as I open them up. Don't you hesitate. But I'm a good religious person. That's your problem, friend. Religion will damn you to hell. Don't talk to me about Sunday morning sacraments. You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. God doesn't have your membership card. He doesn't collect them from the Methodists, the Baptists, or the Assemblies of God. All he sees is one card, and it's blood red. It is blood red, friend. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Look at me, everybody. Do you know the Lord? Don't tell me about him. Tell me, do you know him? Is he your best friend? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your heart? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your heart? Is he your consuming passion? If not, you're backslid. Oh, you've never known the Lord. I'm sorry. It's just that way. I'd rather warn you now when you get upset at me than stand before God on judgment day. And you, took, and you look at me and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me it was going to be like this? Why didn't you tell me he was going to spew me out of his mouth? Well, I'm telling you, young people, if you're not on fire for God, there's sin in your life, you hit these altars as soon as these doors open. As soon as I open it up tonight, you come down here as quick as you can. Is there sin in your life? Those of you that have never known the Lord, we've had witches saved in this place. We've had cult members saved in this place. We've had prostitutes walk in this place. We've had playboy bunnies saved in this place. We've had strippers saved in this place. We've had drug addicts saved in this place. We've had multimillionaires saved in this place. We've had bankers. We've had lawyers. We've had doctors. We've had trash collectors saved in this place. Everybody's the same. We've had them walk in this place agnostics, stoics, God-haters, and leave out with their hands in the air worshiping the Lord. What about it? It's honesty time, okay? Now, I'm going to spend a minute on this altar call tonight, friend. This is why. Because some of you right now, I can feel this. Here's what's happening in the spirit realm. Satan has got some of you pressed into that seat. He'll say things like this. You don't need to go on up there. You don't need to do that. that you, you don't need to do that. This ain't your church. This ain't your place. You think God's telling you to do that? You think God's saying to you, you don't need to go pray? You think God's saying to you, you don't need to repent of your sin? That ain't God speaking to your friend. That's Satan. Why? Because he knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's happened to 20,000 people already. He's sick and tired of it. So he's going to do whatever he can to stop you from repenting. Repenting is coming down and saying, Jesus, wash my sins away. Make me brand new. Wash me clean. I want to turn around. I want to change. Satan can't stand that. Makes no difference your religious affiliation, friend. We've had pastors saved here. Over 25 pastors have received Christ, some of them from major churches. And I've prayed with them, man. I've had pastors confess to me all kinds of stuff that they're going through. Backslid, away from God totally for years. But pastor in the church, day in and day out. How many knows you can do it? You can do it. Some of you can live a good life out there. Everybody thinks you're on fire for God, and you go home, you lock the door, and out comes some hideous sin. That's got you gripped like a vice. You turn the lights out, the, 
your wife goes to bed, the kids go to bed, and you slip out and you say, honey, I can't sleep. You go in and you, you flip on some X-rated movie. There's sin in your life, friend. And you know it. You need to get it right. Get right with the Lord. That's all part of the funeral procession, friend. I can hear the drums in the background. Satan's is tickled pink, man. He's killed you, man. I can hear it. I'm here to offer you hope. But you got to respond. How come I got to get up and come down here? I'll tell you why, friend. If you don't, it means you're ashamed of the Lord. You're full of pride. Pride will damn your soul to hell. Jesus said, you confess me, I'll confess you. You're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. He hung on the cross nude for you. You can't get up at Brownsville Assembly in front of a couple thousand people, stand up and walk down to these altars and say, Jesus, forgive me. If you can't do that, friend, you ain't worth 10 cents anyhow. Your Christianity ain't worth a nickel, and you know it. You know it. You need to come down here, young person, mom and dad, as soon as Charity begins singing this song, stop that funeral procession dead in its tracks and let the hand of God come down and touch you, friend. Let the hand of God heal your backslidings. Let the hand of God bring you home tonight, friend. You're going to rise up in newness of life. Want to know why this revival has been written up so well in the newspapers? That's exactly right. Souls have been saved. Lives have been changed. Why does a news journal call us? They call us and they say, we want to write about your revival again. We want to put it on the front page in color. Why? Lives are changing. Major, big time, changing. And want to know something else? America likes that. America loves true revival. They love true revival. They will embrace a true revival. We always have. We've always embraced true revival. We've loved true revival. It's the faith we can't stand. Be a part of it, friend. Get your life right with the Lord. That's why so many thousands are beside themselves now because they made this trek just like you're going to make right now. They've come down here and gotten right with the Lord. I want everyone to stand. Here's what we're going to do. Charity's going to be singing. She's going to sing, Run to the Mercy Seat. Everyone in this room that is away from the Lord or you need Jesus Christ to forgive your sin, there's sin in your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Jesus Christ came to give you life and life in abundance, friend. He shed his blood 2,000 years ago for you that you might have life. As soon as we begin singing this song, you come to him tonight and ask the Lord to wash that sin away. Young person, he knows what you're going through. He sees you. He saw the widow in the midst of the crowd. He sees you in the midst of this crowd. Mom and dad, he knows what you're going through. Those of you here that your marriage is on the rocks, you don't need marriage counseling. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. When he's in love with Jesus and you're in love with Jesus, everything else sort of falls away, doesn't it, friend? All the other garbage problems go away when you're in love with Jesus. Charity's going to begin singing. If you need Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you're backslid, if you've never known the Lord, or you need forgiveness tonight, don't hesitate. Get up and come as quickly as you can. Charity, I want you to sing this out. And come right now. Right now, come. I need the Lord, and I need him now. Come on, right now. Let's go. Hurry, hurry, hurry. What are you waiting on? Now, 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 now. Come on. Come on, in the balcony, let's go. 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 Come on. 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 I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on, friend. Come on, all the way around. All the way around. Come on. He said that I could come into his presence without fear. Into the holy place, come on. His mercy come on. Me. Come on. Come on. Yes, I'm all the way around. Running. Let's go. I'm come running. on. God bless you, man. I'm running to God bless you. the mercy seat where Jesus is calling.
He said His grace will cover let's me. His blood will flow freely. It will provide the healing. I'm running to the mercy seat. Come on. I'm running to the mercy seat. What are you waiting on? Seat. You need the Lord to forgive you. Step out right now, friend. Step out right now. Let's go. Step out. Step out. Step out. Come on. Come on. Don't anyone leave here at the altar. Stay right where you're at. Come on. God bless you, young people. Are you living where hope has Come on. not been? Come on. I need the Lord. Lost in the curse I need the Lord. of a lifetime of sin. I need the Lord. Come on. Come on. Lovely illusions. They never come true. Well, I know where there's a place of mercy for you. Right here is a place. He said that you can God come you, into man. his presence God bless you. without fear. Into the holy place where his mercy hovers near. Come running. Come on. Come running. Come on. Come run into the Come mercy on. seat where Jesus is Come calling. On. His grace Come on. will be a covering. Come on. His blood will flow freely. It will provide the healing. Come run into the mercy Listen. seat. Listen to your heart, friend. That's the Holy Ghost. He said that I could come into his God, you just stay right where you're at. Let me tell you folks something. Pastors that are visiting, you think you know people? You don't know people. We don't know them. I've been married to the same woman for 17 years. I love her with all my heart. But I don't know her. I don't know what she's going through deep down inside. And you never know what a church person's going through. We should all have learned that by now after the great fallings away and everything that's gone on in the 80s and are still going on in the 90s. We should understand one thing is that we don't know people. The heart is deceitfully wicked and no man can know it. And that's why these altar calls are full of so many different kinds of people. Everyone is going through struggles. A person that you thought is doing great could be in the midst of adultery or entertaining someone around the water fountain at work coming this close to adultery and tonight we're jerked right back into the kingdom you don't know what's going on in people's hearts you don't know then others are here for the very first time but I want to tell you right here friend we're gonna give you one more opportunity where's my drummer when you get behind those drums I'm gonna give you one more opportunity tonight friend to come down here and get your thing your life right with God I don't see how anybody can leave these services. Get in the car, drive over to Denny's or Shoney's or wherever you might go with the conviction that you feel on your heart right now. I couldn't sleep tonight, man. I could not sleep with that. We've had people call the church the next day and ask if they could get saved if it was too late because they stayed up all night long with that saint in their heart doing this. They're lying in their bed. 
Why? Because God's telling you to come down here and get things right right now. This is what we're going to do. Lindell, I'm going to have him do the drum thing. Here's what we're going to do. He's going to play the, the drum roll again. I want everyone in this room to turn to the person next to them. Those of you at the altar, stay right where you're at. God's doing a mighty work down here, man. But every one of you, you're going to turn to the person next to you and you're going to ask them if they need Jesus Christ to forgive them. If they need forgiveness. Don't do it yet. You're going to ask them. If that's a perfect stranger next to you, that's fine. Don't worry about it. Do it anyway. It's about time you talk to strangers. Ask them if they need forgiveness. And look at me, everybody. When they do that, don't lie. Don't lie to them. This ain't the mall. This is not the food court where someone says, How you doing? Fine, fine. You fine, fine. Everybody fine? Yeah, we're fine. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, Julie. See you. Bye. And you walk off eating your hamburger. She walks off drinking her milkshake. And she's going, I'm a liar, man. My marriage is falling apart. My kids are... My kids are on drugs, and I just told that woman everything's fine. This ain't the mall, friend. This is church. This is before Almighty God in this place. If you've got sin in your life, tell that person, I need forgiveness tonight, man. I need to leave out of this place washed in the blood of the Lamb. And then both of you come down here together. Both of you come down here together. This is your opportunity, friend. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. I'm going to close this altar call in just a minute. Don't be one of those that's left outside of it. Come inside of it, friend. When that person turns to you, if you need that sin washed out of your life, you look at them and go, yes, I do. Then both of you come down here. I want everyone to do it. I want you to play them drums. Come on. Everybody do it right now. Ask that person and bring them down here right now. Bring them down here right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes, God bless you. Let's, come on. Come on. Bring them down here right now. Bring them down here right now. Bring them down here right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. Yes, God bless you in the balcony. Come on. Bring them down right now. I need forgiveness. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on down. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Y'all move this way. Spread out that way a little bit. Move up. Donna, help me with those folks right there. Some of y'all follow Donna right here. See this girl with the blonde hair? Follow her this way. Follow her this way. Come on. Get right with the Lord tonight, friend. Get right with the Lord tonight. Oh, Brother Steve, this is morbid, man. No, it's not morbid, friend. This is life. Come on, man. I knew God was speaking to you, brother. That's it. We're going to pray with these folks down here. If you miss this altar call, friend, it's your own cup of tea, all right? I want to tell you a little bit about procrastination. Procrastination, it might work on paying your bills every now and then. You fudge a little bit and you wait a little bit and then you pay them later. It may work, but I want to tell you something right now, friend. Procrastinating with God, one day the trumpet's going to sound. It's over, man. You don't treat God the way you treat everybody else. You honor God, he'll honor you. You draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. You love God, he'll love you. But you think he's just going to sit out there? The Bible says he's standing at the door knocking. He's not sitting, he's standing. That means he can walk away anytime he pleases. The Bible says his spirit will not always contend with you. Just before the flood, that's what the Lord said, my spirit will not always contend with man. Let it rain. I want everyone at the altar to listen to me. You don't have to lift your heads, but I just want you to, matter of fact, I want you to close your eyes, everyone at this altar. I tell you what I'm not looking for at this altar. We see tears. We see brokenness. We see moaning and groaning. We see it all, and I love it all. 
But I'm not looking for outward emotion. What we're looking for inside you is a decision. A decision. Repentance is a decision to change. It's a decision to change. I'm really sick and tired of this, and I'm changing. That's what it's all about. That's what we've learned a lot in this revival. I've seen people that have come and cried their hearts out, backslide. I've seen people come here that didn't have a tear in their eyes, go living for God, and they're on fire for the Lord. Because they're still here. Why? They made a decision at this altar. Make a decision right now. Make a decision right now. I'm going to follow you, Lord. I want to tell you something. Your funeral procession came to an end. As soon as you got up from your pew, the whole crowd stopped. The angel of death was face to face with the Prince of Peace, the Lord and giver of life, the resurrection and the life. And he's reaching out right now and he's touching your life, friend. He's laying his hands on your life right now. I want everyone at the altar to pray with me right now. Pray this prayer out loud. Everyone at the altar. Dear Jesus, once again, out loud. Dear Jesus, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, Lord, that this funeral procession has come to an end. It has been foiled. It has been stopped by the Lord and giver of life. Thank you, Jesus, for coming to me tonight. I ask your forgiveness. I've sinned. I've hurt you, and I've hurt others. Forgive me, Lord. Wash my sins away. I repent. I turn around. I change. Lord, I ask you tonight to be my Savior. My Lord, my very best friend, from this moment on, I will follow you all the days of my life. In your precious name. Thank you, Lord. I'd like for everyone to stand at the altar, if you would. In just a minute, we're going to pray with everyone in this church. We're going to pray for everyone who wants prayer. How many want prayer tonight? Raise your hand. Man, after all we've said about it, I can't imagine you not raising your hand. But honest friends, we've had pastors call us and say things like this. I cannot believe the anointing that came back with me to Arizona. I cannot believe the anointing that came back with me to Illinois. I cannot believe what's happening in New York City right now. That's what's happened to these people. Don Wilkerson just wrote us a letter. He, David Wilkerson's brother was just with us a couple weeks ago. Spent three days in the revival. He wrote me another letter. He still just basking in the power that came all over him while he was in this revival, friend. Just loving it, man. Can't wait to get back. Be prayed for. Be prayed for tonight. Those of you at this altar, look at me right now. I want to share three things with you. Some of you have come back to the Lord tonight from a, you've been in a backslid condition. The best thing you can do tonight, the best thing, everyone look at me. If I'm... If I'm hiding behind that piano or something, just turn this way and listen to me. The best thing you can do tonight is call sin, sin. When you come to the place where you call sin, sin, and don't call it, you know, I, I made a mistake, okay, or I blew it. That's new Webster's definitions of sin. But if you'll read the old Webster's Dictionary, and I've got one in my library from the 1800s, sin is disobedience to God, man. It's breaking God's law. It's breaking God's heart. It's an abomination. Call sin, sin. Whatever it might be, that's your first step to getting right with God. Whatever it might be. Those of you that are pastors that you may have slipped away. You slipped away from God. By, by calling those things that came into your life sin, rather than you know, I just got a bum steer or, you know, 
I, this happened. There was a difficulty here and a difficulty there. If this hadn't happened, I wouldn't have done this. No. Sin. You carry the load. You say, I'm a sinner. I've, I've broken God's heart. And then repent like you have tonight. That is so important. We have some folks that are going to talk to you in just a minute, and they want to pray with you. And if they can pray with you about specifics, let them. They're going to ask you if there's something they can pray with you about. If you're an adulterer, you can tell them. They're not going to tell nobody. They're going to pray with you about that. If you're involved in some hideous sin, I've had people confess crimes in this place and break down, fall on the ground, just wailing over a crime they committed. They, they had to get forgiveness, friend. And if that's you tonight, you've committed a crime, we'll pray with you. And we'll also tell you if we think that you need to go to the authorities. We'll tell you. You need to get that out of your life, friend. We've done that in this place. We've done it. We've had some folks go to jail. But they got clean, man. They came clean. I'll never forget a time in Teen Challenge when a young man came to me. And he got right with God in Teen Challenge. He came to me and said, Steve, I've committed murder. I killed a woman up in Chicago. He said, but that was years ago. He said, what do you think I ought to do? I said, go to the authorities and confess. He did, and they put him in penitentiary for 15 years. They made him do all 15 years in the penitentiary. You want to know what he became in the penitentiary? The chaplain. Led hundreds of people to the Lord. Wasn't bitter. The freest man alive behind bars. Because he got things right. But we want to pray with you, so let us pray with you tonight. We don't want to pray some some frivolous prayer. We want to pray a serious prayer with you tonight to help you through your problems. Three things before they pray with you. Come to this revival as much as you can. Look at me. This revival is going on Tuesday night, prayer meeting, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Come to these meetings as much as you can. If you live within two hours of here, you need to make plans to be, leave, be in at least two meetings a week. Soak in this presence of the Lord. Learn these songs. If you're here for the first time and you don't understand the songs, you will if you'll come to the revival and you'll grow in God. Young people, come to this revival. Tomorrow night, service is at 6 o'clock. And by the way, everybody, next week, everybody listen to this. Next week, we're taking two days break. Next week, we're taking Wednesday and Thursday break. We're not going to have revival those two nights. And here's why. We've been going nonstop since the beginning of the year. And summer's coming. Summer is going to be a zoo in this place. And we need two days rest. Huh? Summer's coming up in two weeks. So we're going to take a couple days off. Okay? You may say, well, how can you do that? It, it's hard for me, friend. Because a couple days rest usually means five to six hundred souls that weren't saved. But I want to tell you something else. We need a rest. We need a couple days. We've been going on nonstop, and summer is going to be grueling. So I want a breather. Pastor wants a breather. Linda wants a breather. How many believe it'd be okay? I think, I think the folks that would have been saved on Wednesday and Thursday, they'll come on that Friday. We'll be here that Friday night and come early that Friday night, friend. This place is going to be packed. So that's next week. But come to the revival tomorrow night at 6. The second thing. Tomorrow night. That's right. Tomorrow's Friday. 7 o'clock tomorrow night, Saturday at 6. The second thing. Get involved in a strong local church. If you don't know where to go, our friends, your, the altar workers can help you. If you want to go to a powerful Methodist church, they can help you. Assembly of God, they can help you. Pentecostal, they can help you. Go to a church. Get involved in a church. And the last thing is, be baptized. Look at me, everybody. Tomorrow night, we have baptisms here. There ain't nothing like being baptized in this Brownsville revival. Be baptized. Tell our worker that you want to be baptized. But I was baptized when I was 12. Yeah. What have you lived like since then? If you've drifted away from God, you need to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. Be baptized. Tell our worker you want to be baptized in this revival tomorrow night. We'll sign you up for it. God bless you. Flip around, and there's someone standing right there next to you that wants to talk to you. Don't leave without talking to one of them. I'm about to drop. 
Living here has caused me pain I just don't understand I must recount your faithfulness And the mercy of your hand When everything is said and done And there's nothing left to say The cross of Christ is proof enough You are good You are good You are good Mercy, Lord, has pierced my heart. It brings me to my knees. In reverent fear, I'll trust your ways and worship at your feet. Everything's been said and done, and there's nothing left to say. The cross of Christ is proof enough you are good you are good you are good you're the Mercy, Lord, has pierced my heart. It brings me to my knees. In reverent fear, I'll trust your ways and worship at your feet. When everything is said and done, and there's nothing left to say. The cross of Christ is proof in love. You are good. You are good. You are good. You are good.
friend of God, how sweet to be the friend of God. Friend of God, how sweet to be the friend of God. Promises seek fulfillment, Lord, fade into flame, revive the fire again. From the Pacific to Atlantic coast, we need the fire of the Holy Ghost. house with the power of love, holy repentance through your blood, fan into flame with fire, with fire again. From the Pacific to Atlantic coast, we need the fire of the Holy 
visitor to the revival. Tonight's your first night here. We want to be sure that you're prayed for. That's the concern of Brother Steve Hill and Pastor John Kilpatrick, that everyone has a chance to receive this awesome anointing. We want you to come up, if you will, now. First time you've ever been to Brownsville Revival, come up front, if you will. Come all the way down the aisles and move from right to left, and we're going to pray for you. There's been an incredible, awesome anointing that's been going on for the last 11 months now, and it's for you. All you have to do is expect God to touch you. He's going to touch you. Now, I do want to share something with you just briefly. Please do not let anyone pray for you that does not have on a purple badge. It's a badge that looks like this. Please come all the way down the aisles, if you will. I know it's a little crowded tonight, but if you can push to the right or to the left, it'll give access for the pastor and Steve to come and pray for you and others. So if you come all the way down, please do not let, once, once again, let me say, please do not let anyone pray for you that does not have this purple badge on. The reason for that is we don't know who everyone is here tonight. So many new strange faces every night. And we don't want someone praying for you that has a bad spirit. We sure don't want a witch praying for you. We don't want a warlock praying for you. But we are sure of the ones that have this badge, who they are and their life, and that they do have that anointing flowing in their lives. So please, do not let anyone pray for you that does not have this purple badge on. Also, we would just ask you that when the person comes up to pray for you tonight if there is a special need that you have. We're not here on an assembly line. We're not here to have a production line. We care about you. And so if you have a special need tonight, just let those who are praying for you, let them know. And if it's something very personal, it'll be kept in confidence by them. So trust them. We know who they are. Expect the Lord to touch you. 
We're just going to gently lay our fingers on your forehead. This is not the push down, knock down revival. If you go down, you'll go down because the Holy Spirit put you down. And if that's the reason that you go down, then please stay there and let God begin to minister to you. That's why he does this, not for a show. If you don't, don't, don't go down, please don't feel that God hasn't touched your life. We've had so many people leave the revival, didn't feel anything. They go back to their church and all heaven comes down. God loves you. Prepare your heart as we begin to reach out to you tonight with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God bless you as you're waiting. to the day.
Worship the Lord, worship the Lord. I worship you. Stay in his presence. We'll pray for you. Just stay in his presence.
and just stay in his presence. No. Don't know why Jesus loves me. I don't know why he cares. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. touch from you, Jesus. Fresh touch. No. 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 Let the Lord love on you. No. Lord. Fresh anointing. Fresh anointing. Fresh touch from you, Jesus. 
fresh anointing. Friends, he's here. Just receive what he has for you. It's a fresh touch from Jesus. For many of you, the things of this world are going to grow strangely dim. You're going to find yourself just going after Jesus. That's all that matters. This is the anointing. This is from Jesus right there. This is a fresh anointing. you 